on the panel, we have folks that are uh, kind of on the commercial side of things. Certainly, uh, Shapeshift is, uh, I'd say, a consumer forward facing uh, business that is taking crypto into America's heartland. You know, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's, it's come along after the initial burst. Uh, and also on the panel, we have Roger uh, Vare and Charles, and you guys are more of the initial kind of first wave of Bitcoin and, and going back to the 20, uh, you know, you go back to two, 2009, I think. Not quite 10 years. 2010. <laughs> he was trying to out you as Satoshi. Right, we're trying to out you. But in the first wave, you know, you, you, you know the Bitcoin Jesus, you don't get that moniker unless you're early. You get the early. So uh, I guess the, the, the topic of contraction or expansion so we'll start with Roger. So um, on the kind of the big picture, if you will, without talking about specific companies per se, but the, the mission, the vision, the Satoshi vision, um, is it expanding? Is it contracting? Uh, your thoughts? So without getting into the scaling debate, uh, yeah. cryptocurrency as a whole are obviously are expanding. It's going crazy. And here we are at you know, one of the most prestigious event centers in the entire country where some really high power events have taken place. We're here at the Aspen Inst Institute talking about cryptocurrencies. That's a sign that this is really catching on mainstream. It's being adopted all over the world. It's not guaranteed that it's going to be Bitcoin in the end, uh, but cryptocurrencies are here to stay. They're not going anywhere, and it's only going to get bigger and bigger and more and more popular from here on out. Okay, quick uh, add-on. So when you see a state actor like China looking like they're trying to ban uh, uh, Bitcoin, et cetera, is that a, a factor going forward, or are they barking up the wrong tree? That's probably a signal that we should buy more because China has already banned YouTube. They've banned Google, they've banned Facebook, they've banned Twitter, and if you had invested in any of those things early on, you would have done very, very well. Fair enough. Good point. All right. So Charles, um, take us, walk us through a little bit. You, you know, you definitely. I heard your talk yesterday. A great overview. Of Bitcoin, where we are, where we've been, where we're going. So give us your look down through sixty thousand feet. Where are we going to be in five years with the crypto space and Bitcoin space? Where are we headed? So the short answer is, I don't know, but uh, I can speculate like everybody else. You know, when I got in the space, it was, uh, I got in academically, I, I created a class and I taught people about Bitcoin. And then later on in 2013, I got in professionally. Since those early days that Roger and I were in, uh, the growth has been astronomical. It's gone from, you know, anytime somebody mentioned something, it would be front page on Bitcoin Reddit. It would be a huge thread in Bitcoin talk. I mean, like very trivial things to nobody. It's like global phenomena, right? So the question is, is it going to continue to grow? In what ways is it going to grow? Who are the leaders going to be? And I think, also, honestly, uh, the question is, how will this technology actually impact society as a whole? And, and this is actually where we're going. Uh, we're starting to already see dramatic changes in the way banks think. We're starting to already see innovation across every piece of the financial stack. We're starting to see big discussions about identity. So if I had to guess, where are we going to go in three to five years? I think we could go to a password-free internet. I think we can go to a very decentralized way of handling domain names. I think we can talk about putting credentials on a blockchain, breaking up the educational monopoly. Uh, we can talk about instantaneous flow of value to countries that really have a difficult time with the current banking stack. Now, the question is who's going to be the winner and loser? I, I just don't know. But I do know this technology is not only here to stay, that the investments are increasing by an order of magnitude every single year. We've seen it go from hundreds of thousands to millions to tens of millions to hundreds of millions to billions of dollars flowing into this space in just a matter of five and a half years, which is extraordinary. So, uh, so I, I believe that uh, that's probably the way to look at it is to say, are these trends going to continue? And then what industries are going to get disrupted or changed? Okay, a follow-up to this, and I'm going to go back to Roger for his comment, and then we'll go work our way down the line here. So um, you were a co-founder of Ethereum, and Ethereum went through a, um, a split. Right. Uh, um, and we have Ethereum Classic, and we have um, Ethereum. And um, it, was, it, it, it seemed by most observers to go down fairly um, without too much drama. And uh, of course, in the Roger mentioned the, um, the the scaling debate. In the case of Bitcoin, there's been a lot of drama around the, the, the this this issue. Why do you think that in Ethereum's case we did saw very little drama, uh, and why do you see so much in Bitcoin? In your you know in your opinion, that's a really good question. So in the case of Ethereum, it was over a particular event, 
and most of the founding core stayed with the uh, the original chain, and, and a small minority branched off. Uh, and uh, it basically, there was just a, a brewing malcontent with many decisions that had been made. And so people decided, hey, let's go and choose a different route. In the case of Bitcoin, there's no clear leader. There's no Vitalik Buterin, you know, the one we had left a long time ago. And, and as a consequence, we just had a lot of camps, very powerful, very well capitalized camps who have a great degree of influence and control. And these camps just couldn't quite find a way to work together well for a variety of reasons. And so they tried very hard, but at the end of the day, it seemed like the divorce had to happen. And unfortunately, it was a pretty messy divorce. Mm -hmm. I want to bring in uh, Roger Ver on this because he gave an interesting answer to that question last night about why you thought the, the, the Ethereum blockchain had less drama. Uh, well, I guess part of it is that the difficulty for mining Ethereum adjusts after every single block, whereas with Bitcoin, it's after every 2,016 blocks. And the hardware that's used for mining Ethereum are graphics cards that people have all over the world, whereas with Bitcoin, it's a very specialized hardware. And uh, I think that there's a lot of fear between the SegWit version of Bitcoin, that if the Bitcoin Cash version of Bitcoin takes enough of the hash rate away from it, it'll really start to cause problems with the SegWit version of Bitcoin. So I think that makes the infighting the animosity just that much more uh, rough and uh but from my point of view i wish the divorce had happened several years ago and i think the entire ecosystem would be much farther ahead to, uh, than we are today okay fair enough um so let's move down to the, the panel line here so um as i try to break this up a little bit so these guys are kind of looking at the big picture from the philosophical picture a little bit and you guys are actually kind of in the day-to-day -day, you know certainly shapeshift as customers every single day zen Cash. And so what's your experience been just dealing with this on the front line of you're in the crypto business? It's a brand new business. How does it how do, how are you? What are your experiences? What are your challenges? Do you, is this expanding, contracting? What are your thoughts? Hi, my name is Ari again. New kid on the block. So uh, for us, uh, our company is called Storm. We're building Storm Market. And what we're doing is a gamified microtask marketplace. Uh, the l lingo is uh, earn anywhere, anytime, from any device. And so our perspective and point of view is really around user experience and design. You know, the technology has been around a little bit. There's definitely going to be a lot more improvements to it. But the way you really increase democratize access to any sort of technology is really on the front end, the, the user experience, how you talk about it, how you visualize it, and making sure that there's enough research and enough experts on that front is really important to us. Next. Yeah, so at Shapeshift, um, I think it's very clear to us that the crypto industry is expanding and expanding very quickly. Um, Three, you know, three, three and a half years ago when we started Shapeshift, we had this thesis that um, the majority of assets in the world would be digitized and that people would want to trade between those digital assets. At the time, um, many people, including investors that we were trying to get on board, with the exception of someone like Roger, who was nice enough to invest very early on, um, really thought we were crazy. Um, even people in the Bitcoin industry didn't really see it. They thought Bitcoin would be the only real digital asset and that nothing else would matter. Um, over the last kind of year and a half, especially with the rise of you know token sales and Ethereum and a number of other assets and it becoming easier to digitize assets, um, I think our thesis has been proven very correct. And we've seen even some of the older Bitcoin players, such as you know Coinbase and some of the, you know, the people who've been around a lot longer start to move that direction as well, because I think they see the writing on the wall. Um, in our case, Shapeshift has grown tremendously um, every year of its existence, but especially over the last year and even just the last six months. And we just see things expanding in every direction, and it's very hard to keep up. You know, one of our biggest challenges is dealing with the fact that a lot of the software that we have to run in order to make our system work um, is often what I would say nothing better than like a very advanced alpha, if, we're, if I'm being generous. Um, a lot of the software is not even that good, and even Bitcoin, you know, the core Bitcoin software, is almost never tested at scale by the actual developers. Um, they... They don't see the kind of transaction volumes that we do. They don't see the kind of throughput that we do. And so often we're talking with all these various communities to help them improve their software because we have no choice. It's the only way to make it work. So 
in our sense, um, there's a lot of challenges and a lot of technical, you know, kind of hurdles that are going to need to be overcome. But we think those will be overcome, and it's just going to continue to expand. Okay, so you said that in the case of, let's say, Coinbase, they, they are now moving more toward a, 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 expanding and in incorporating other cryptocurrencies, uh, which is a slightly different than, let's say, the original mission statement was very Bitcoin specific, and mm -hmm. there's this meme of the Bitcoin maximalist, uh, and that all others are, you know, pretenders, et cetera. But you're seeing at Shapeshift, and in your observation of the industry, is that this multi-crypto world is emerging, and, and everyone is kind of getting getting on the boat uh, on the boat here. That uh, Bitcoin is just one of many uh, cryptos. Yes, absolutely. Um, I would say that. You know, a lot of the people who are these quote unquote Bitcoin maximalists, their original vision is that, you know, there should only be one type of money or one really good money and that it doesn't make sense to necessarily have competing types of money that that kind of detracts from its value. And in some ways, there's there's an argument there that makes sense. But I think what was missed is that um, money is obviously not the only type of important asset. You know, we see in the legacy financial system, there's thousands and thousands of different types of financial assets. And it's not going to be any different in the crypto world. You know, there, there's no reason that the majority of these assets should not be digitized. And there's no reason that a blockchain is not, probably not the best way to do that, um, at least of what we have of current technology. So, yeah, what we see is just assets expanding in every direction. And there's no reason that there's only going to be one of these things. In fact, it's inevitable there's going to be thousands or millions of them. Let's hear from Zencash. <laughs> yeah, no, so I would say the cat's out of the bag and we're at the start of a big revolution that's definitely not going to go away. Uh, so we see this all the time where, I mean, it's the difference between uh, a controlled system where you have one monopolist that can do everything that it wants, completely unresponsive to its customers, or you have a fully competitive system that could constantly expand, iterate, innovate, um, you know, in a permissionless fashion. I think the difference between the two is you know, uncategorically better when you have full competition versus a monopolist. Uh, I couldn't think of any, any industry where it would make sense for a monopolist to be the best or optimal solution for any, any solution set. So what we're seeing here is we're just seeing this massive, rapid explosion of innovation where things are happening in real time. And in our market, what I think is really interesting is, so this industry has been dominated basically by U.S. and European, you know, developers and early entrepreneurs that kind of got out there up front. But now we're seeing growth, enormous growth overseas in different regions. And that's actually what we're trying to do. So we have actually our, our CIS, our Eastern Europe, Eastern Europe and Russia uh, lead here right now. Um, so we're, we're growing explosively in parts of the world where the crypto, you know, other cryptocurrency projects may not have initially been focusing. Um, but these people in these regions that we always talk about as being great use cases for what we're doing, we're actually going out there and I think that they're very motivated to get into this revolution. Um, I have a question regarding, speaking of explosive growth, of initial coin offerings, ICOs. There's been a huge expansion. I, I get emails like 50 a day saying, oh, we have this new ICO coming out. I, I wanted to ask Charles Hoskinson first because he's a cryptographer, so he knows like whether or not there's actually any point in many of these so-called tokens and whether or not the SEC, which has now made a ruling on that is saying that these are, you can call them tokens, but many of them are securities. Uh, also, China's clamping down on it. Do you see any necessity for most of these? And do you think this industry of the ICO market will be hit hard soon? Right, that's a really good question. So first, uh, we remember when color came to movies. Was it The Wizard of Oz, a few of them? And a lot of filmmakers didn't actually know how to use color. Things were a bit too vibrant. People would throw up. The same for 3D. Anybody been to a 3D movie where it was a little overdone? Maybe at least one of you. And it's the same thing here. You know, ICOs are a neutral thing. They're a, a tool that one can use to provide liquidity. It's like the ultimate crowd sale. Now, like all tools, you can use them to do great good or great evil. And now that people realize that they can raise tens of millions of dollars without asking anyone's permission or going through any particular channel, uh, they're doing it. I went to an ICO summit recently in Switzerland. It was actually just last week. And I found out there's 200 active ICOs going on this month. I don't even know where the hell they all are. You know, it's, it's pretty crazy. When China shut down the ICO industry, I, I found out there were 60 platforms running ICOs with several hundred ICOs that had already been, happened. 
So to answer your question more specifically, um, you asked about the regulatory implications. I think it's a facts and circumstances argument, as the SEC made a, uh, evident with their uh, Dow ruling. And uh, if the token has no utility and there's no natural demand for the token outside of speculation, uh, then it's probably a security. The ultimate test you can use, the armchair test, is remove the company that's raising the money. Is the protocol still there? If Vitalik Buterin was to die in a plane crash and the Ethereum Foundation was to go away, Ethereum would still be here, as would Bitcoin if you know, Coinbase went down. But if you look at a lot of these things, if, it, you know, if you remove the central company, the protocol dies, it probably is a security in that sense. Now, your final point question uh, was on, are these necessary or not? And unfortunately, I think the vast majority that are occurring are just existing or kind of far-fetched business models that haven't gone through peer review or due diligence. And the, the reality is, no, they're not necessary, and uh, they will result in failure. But to be frank, this is how venture capital works. We're just exposing the risks and hazards of venture capital now to a larger group of people. The reality is, if you're Kleiner Perkins, you will see hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of business plans that are batshit insane. <laughs> and unfortunately, you will see hundreds and hundreds of ventures you've funded, which in hindsight turn out to be batshit insane, a la pets.com. And that's just basically where we are as an industry. It's just the risk is now being uh, pushed upon a, a, a less and less affluent group and a larger and larger group of potential speculators. So you, you mentioned uh, the VCs there. Are ICOs now going to disrupt the VC business? Well, we got a VC right here. I mean, Roger, has it disrupted yeah. your business at all? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we've, we've seen Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies disrupt, you know, banks and PayPal and things like that. Of course, uh, ICOs are disrupting venture capital. And in fact, I think just recently, the total amount of money being invested in new businesses due to ICOs surpassed the amount that's being invested due to legacy venture capital firms. So like that's a really, really incredible turning point. Uh, one of the downsides of that is it fills up all of our inboxes every day with yeah. a million and one people with their new ICO. It's impossible to tell the difference between any of them. Uh, you know, when it was just like five a month or something, it was easy. Now it's just like five a day or an hour, and you're just like, oh my God, half of these have to be scams. But um, what about China in terms of these ICOs? This is the first they really clamped down is stopping the ICOs. How much liquidity were Chinese investors? I know Chinese investors are famously very... Um, they're not risk averse, let's say. They're very uh, gung-ho on any investment. So wh what sort of liquidity were they providing to the market? And are we going to see Bobby Lee hanged? <laughs> uh, hopefully we will not see anybody hanged in China for being involved in, in the space. But uh, I'm a little bit jet lagged at the moment because I just flew in from Hong Kong and arrived yesterday morning from a big conference uh, that took place in Hong Kong that was supposed to take place a week earlier in Beijing but they had to cancel the entire conference and move it to Beijing, I'm sorry, to Hong Kong, from Beijing because of the regulators there. And so there were a bunch of these Chinese businessmen that are running Bitcoin exchanges and cryptocurrency exchanges and are involved in all that. The big talk at the conference was they were talking about how quickly they can move to a country other than China so they can continue doing what they're doing. And uh, I think a lot of them will do exactly that. So uh, it might slow it down a little bit within China, but uh, this is a worldwide phenomenon and anybody can participate. And the entire point is that this enables permissionless innovation, meaning you don't need the permission of people in Beijing that you've never met, nor for the permission from people in Washington, D.C. that you've never met. So that's the entire point of what we're up to here. We're about permissionless innovation, permissionless payments, permissionless freedom. And I want to follow up on with Shapeshift and these, uh, the exchanges here regarding ICOs and this uh, ruling from the SEC or the, the, the paper they issued. Uh, saying that the, many of these are securities. What sort of, are, are, is that forcing you into doing more due diligence and compliance? And what is your role in, in, in offering these tokens on your platforms? Yeah, great question. Um, so I do think that the SEC uh, announcement um, was a bit of a, what we call, you know, a shot across the bow. It was a bit of a warning sign to the industry. But at the same time, anyone who's been in the industry, especially on the exchange side and been paying attention, it didn't really contain a lot of news in it. Um, it was not a surprise that the SEC thought some tokens were potentially securities. And it wasn't particularly a surprise that the Dow in particular 
would thought to be a security because it was it had all sorts of elements of a security, such as voting rights, potential profit sharing, all these sort of things the SEC looks at to determine whether it's a security. Um, an important thing in the SEC ruling, I think, is that they did not say that all tokens blanketly are securities. They were very clear to not say that. So they actually left the door wide open that there are many tokens out there, if structured in a certain way, that may be, you know, a utility token or may not be a, you know, may not be a security at all. Um, I do think it's causing um, a lot of exchanges, including ourselves, to, you know, take, you know, more of a fine tooth comb to which tokens and assets we're willing to list, um, being very careful not to list ones that we think will be considered a security. Um, especially the large order book exchanges, um, you know, some of, I talk to a lot of them all the time and they are all certainly being a lot more cautious than they were before. Um, but then again, to, it's really important to repeat that I don't, anyone who's been paying attention, this just, it wasn't a big piece of news. Um, none of us were surprised that the SEC made that ruling and it didn't really change any of our business models because we were never trying to list tokens that were a security in the first place. Okay. So, uh, with Shapeshift, of course, uh, because of BitLicense in New York, you guys moved uh, jurisdictions, correct? So, no, well, all we did is we, you know, Shapeshift is a worldwide entity. We serve everybody in the world and, the, you know, we're a very global company. Um, all we did is we blocked the jurisdiction of New York when they passed the BitLicense. We were never based there, but we can't serve customers there um, and we don't believe they should with the kind of onerous reporting requirements they have. And honestly, you know, we, we helped put up a, a website right when that happened called pleaseprotectconsumers.com that kind of um, was used as an industry example of why we don't think these things are a good idea. And I think we've just been proven right time and time again ever since then. You know, the most recent example being the Equifax hack of why these giant institutions should not be holding these treasure troves of data. It's not a good thing, and it's just a honeypot for hackers to come and get it. The best defense against hackers is to not hold the data in the first place. May I comment? So um, we're a company that's actually planning and in the midst of launching a crowd sale. Uh, we haven't announced a date yet, and we're actually dealing with a lot of the unknowns in the space. Um, are you security or are you not a security? What are you? What do you think about the regulators? Um, we're working with various lawyers of all different kinds, and yes, we are based out of the United States. Um, and so we have to be very conscious of that. But I'd like to take the conversation up a level and go into conceptual. Conceptually, I think we all just have to take a moment and say, let's just use common sense. You know, the VC world has already set best practices of what is a good company and what is likely to not be a good company, right? Um, they generally, I, I mean, I've been working out of 500 startups in San Francisco for many years. Um, this isn't our first rodeo. And so very often an investor, and I've been an angel myself, you go, do I believe in the team? What is the intrinsic motivation on why they exist? Are they solving a real problem? And does this problem need to be solved? Do people want this solved? Right? Like basic, basic human questions need to be asked more than, is this a speculative effort and am I going to make a ton of money? Like that's not the question we want you to think about. We need to think about human-centered fundamentals. And this is where we really believe we're solving a big problem. Um, if you look at today's payment systems, it's not built for microtransactions. I mean, I hear the conversation over and over again, just sitting in the cafeteria here, or the tent, um, the unbanked, like that's a very popular term that people are talking about. But what does the unbanked mean? It means there's a whole set of people, like human beings, that don't have access to resources. They're kind of lucky they're unbanked if they're here in the U.S. because everybody was hacked by Equifax, so. <laughs> that. Exactly. Yeah. And I'd like to actually point out that I think one of the main points of cryptocurrency and Bitcoin specifically and why I got involved is to unbank the banked. <laughs> the entire point is to make it so that we don't need bank accounts anymore. So let's unbank the banked. <laughs> That's really good. So um, now... Speaking of the bank, uh, the biggest in America is J.P. Morgan. Uh, you know what question's coming about this, right? <laughs> J.P. Morgan, uh, J Jamie Dimon has been floated often as a possible treasury secretary or you know, president, 
they're actually saying that he could run as president. Uh, he's doubling down again today. I guess he said uh, Bitcoin is a fraud. <laughs> his his name, he has, you know, he's connected. He can speak to people. And if he, obviously he feels this is a competition. Do you think the likes of, I, I'll ask Roger first because he's the closest and I could just hand the microphone to you. Do you think he could have some role in making things difficult for American companies involved with Bitcoin? I think Jamie Dimon doesn't understand Bitcoin and what it's about. And uh, I'm more than happy, uh, Jamie, I'll be your private tutor and I'll teach you all about everything. I'll donate my time to do that. And once you understand what this is all about, you will want to get involved in a big, big way because you'll understand that this is one of the most important inventions in the entire history of humankind, right up there on par with how important it was with the invention of electricity or the internet itself. That's how important the invention of Bitcoin was and the distributed ledger technologies that it's enabled since then. So Jamie, I'll be your private tutor. That's a good offer. He should take him up on that. Now, now I'm going to pass it to Charles because Charles, um, you know, uh, Jamie Dimon, JP Morgan, all these banks, Goldman Sachs were involved in trying to develop their own blockchain. Do you think the process of him, of his bank going through that, that he really understood how much of a threat blockchain and Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies are to their business model? You know, first, first with respect to asking a banker about whether they like Bitcoin or not, that's kind of like asking a king, do you like democracy? <laughs> I mean, if you think about it. Um, y you know, these first $13 billion in fines or something like that under his, his reign, uh, the guy's a tapeworm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, so, Max's so, <laughs> but no, I mean, I, I, I honestly, it, it's just so thoroughly frustrating and insulting when people who know very little about what we do watch an up-and-coming technology and have the audacity to call us all criminals. You know, we're not the criminals here. The whole damn reason this ecosystem exists is because they're the criminals. Yes. And, you know, it doesn't really matter at this point what he thinks. The genie's out of the bottle. Somebody in this room or somebody at this conference or somebody around the world is going to solve the problem of decentralized lending and value-stable currencies and decentralized exchange. And within five to ten years, banks will become less and less relevant just like landline telephones are becoming less and less relevant. And we're going to wake up one day and we're going to be in charge of our own money. And Jamie Dimon, in retirement, can watch the world as it is, not the world as he would like it to be. I'll say I think he said that to get attention, first of all. Um, but I'll, I'll go to the other point of your question was, can he, what can he do to, to stop this? Or... He, Maybe not him in particular, but the type of, uh, you know, hierarchy that he might represent in a lot of people's minds. Yes, they can actually cause a lot of pain across the board. So it's something that we have to just be realistic about. Um, so, you know, as we go forward, uh, I, I think we need to keep that in mind and make sure that we self-regulate uh, on a number of fronts. And we try to you know, do things very much in the open and just try to be really good examples of good human beings who are doing the right thing from the start. Rather than have, you know, in retrospect, people come down on us for doing things that, you know, they, they can point to us and say, aha, I told you all along, these guys are a bunch of criminals. Like, we need to show that we're the exact opposite. <laughs> yeah, so I, I would say on this topic, you know, when you see someone like Jamie, Jamie Dimon calling Bitcoin a fraud, or you see China coming down hard on Bitcoin, these are very good signs for the industry. This means that they see this technology as an actual real threat. Do you think they would waste their time saying these things if they didn't actually think it was a threat to their own businesses and, you know, their own control over, you know, monetary policy and the, you know, the world as a whole? Um, I don't think they would. I think the fact that it's getting more attention and that they're starting to speak up about these things is a natural part of the pushback that comes with a disruptive technology like this. Um, you know, it, you wouldn't see in this, but it's almost it's almost like watching, you know, the the U.S post office back when the internet and email was first starting to come out saying, oh, email is a fraud. <laughs> this is completely ridiculous. It doesn't have a stamp. You never, you don't send it in the mail. It gets there instantly. This, this, this cannot possibly be anything but a fraud. That's what I feel like when I see Jamie Dimon calling Bitcoin a fraud. And just like email started to proliferate and obviously became a much more useful tool than the post office, um, Bitcoin and cryptocurrency and you know, decentralized assets, token sales, all these various things that the industry is begetting, um, 
they're going to be much more useful than any of the other legacy systems. And that's why you have this kind of pushback. Change is hard. It's hard for humans, no matter who you are or where you are, right? I have to go with the humanistic uh, answer here. And, uh, but we can do something about it as a community. Like each one of us in this room, to make change easier for our neighbors, our friends, our bankers. I mean, we all have relationships. It's literally educating people. Education is the greatest, I guess, power battle weapon against fear. Educate our friends, our neighbors, our family members, the people that we work with, and that's the best we can do together. That's good. I'm going to, uh, Max and I are, uh audience facing so we hear back from all sorts of people around the world when we talk about bitcoin so i'll present you with uh, some of their arguments and you could address it I, I already pretty much know how you're going to address it but there's this one notion uh, so we had a hurricane and all the electricity was out and people wrote to us what good is my bitcoin now huh uh, so if there's electricity goes out or an EMP or something like that, they always say that the whole electric grid could be knocked off <laughs> and apparently never brought back online, uh, that the government might shut down the internet and then what would your Bitcoin be worth? So there are these sort of arguments. And I know like everybody here is quite advanced in, in Bitcoin and it seems silly, but those questions are out there and you know, from ordinary investors and citizens and residents. So what do you say to that? If you think that your bank account or your credit card or your PayPal account or any of those things are going to work with the internet is offline or electricity is offline, you're being naive. So of course those things aren't going to work either. So the same pro the world's in big, big trouble if the entire world's electricity and internet is offline. <laughs> you, have, you have bigger problems to worry about than your Bitcoin wallet not being accessible. <laughs> Anybody else have anything to add on that? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, just kind of adding on what Roger just said, you know, I, I think these are arguments made by people who think that when they deposit, you know, $50,000 into their bank account, that their bank is actually holding $50,001 bills or something crazy like that in a bank vault just waiting for them. Just, you know, it's just there. When in the reality is the majority of money and asset value is already electronic. You know, it's, it, the reality is Bitcoin and things that are cryptographically, can be cryptographically derived. The fact that you can actually keep your crypto assets on a paper wallet, you know, you can have a seed and something that you could always derive later. That's going to be much more secure than these centralized databases that get destroyed. And you see all the wealth of the world destroyed if all of the electricity went off. In fact, crypto at that point, when people could start getting generators or little bits of electricity, would be one of the only assets you could actually recover. Um, you, you're not going to recover from the centralized databases that, you know, all their backups are destroyed of. Okay. Oh, I was going to move on from that because that's uh, actually a lot of the people who say this are gold or silver investors. And they say, I can hold my silver, bury it in the backyard. Yeah, yeah, we're, we're going to be debating the ship about this uh, at 4 o'clock, I believe. But um, what do you say about, we'll, we'll talk down to the consumer-facing guys down here, is that... Bitcoin is the gold for the millennial generation. It's a safe haven asset for the millennial generation. Do you see this? Do you believe it's true? And what do you say to people who say, like, it, it's, it's never going to be gold. It's not money. Sure. No, I, I can speak to this as a financial economist, actually. And I, I think that people should stop looking at the world in a binary fashion where you have to believe in Bitcoin 100% in order to start getting some. I think that's kind of silly. Um, so the, these, and even piggybacking on the last question about the EMP. Yeah, I mean, if, Sure, that, that's a massive issue if something like that were to happen, but you don't put your entire life savings into piles of gold in your house, you know. So just rationally diversify. So the same thing is said for this whole, like, store value case and kind of digital gold for millennials. Absolutely. I, I think it should be. It's cross-border. It's easier to use than gold, whatnot. Um, but also buy some gold, buy some silver. It doesn't have to be one or the other. So I really don't understand these debates between gold bugs and, and us and crypto. It's, you know, I, I love gold, too. You know, so I think we should all just get everything. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, many gold bugs are a little bit angry that they didn't invest in Bitcoin four years ago. Um, and I've talked to quite a few who, who wish they had um, because gold has remained relatively flat during that time. Um, and Bitcoin is obviously, you know, not. <laughs> um, so 
I, I think that the younger generation, millennials, et cetera, they, they, they have more of a natural affinity for this stuff. They've actually grown up um, kind of using variations of digital assets. Anyone who's played something, you know, like an MMO, World of Warcraft, or, you know, these video game industries where there's already virtual economies that have existed for, you know, 10, 15 years. And they've seen this and they understand that it has actual value and they just don't have this kind of skepticism that, um, you know, maybe other generations do who are looking at things like gold and silver and think, well, they're, they're kind of using this, this argument from induction, what I would call it. Um, and which is, it's always been this way and therefore it'll always be that way. And that's always a good argument until it's not, until the rules change. And I think some people are starting to realize that the rules are starting to change and that that argument's not going to hold that much water that much longer. I mean, just reiterating, millennials, we, we already live in this world. Um, the world is just catching up to the way we see it. And so, as gamers, yes, we've earned tokens and coins and stamina points. It's awesome. And uh, we grew up with Facebook. We've all had, grew up with iPads from the you know, age of five and on. Um, this is normal for us. And so, um, and, and what we value is a little bit different, right? The way we shop, the way we interact, what we like to spend our time and money on is also different. We really believe in social networks and reputation and, and exchanging ideas and experiences. And really, going to a fully digital, crypto-enabled world is an amazing experience. And I think we can all embrace that. Yeah, cool. Uh, maybe uh, a few questions from the audience? Uh, yes, sir? Um, so let's say in the event of a uh, financial So if you look at uh, thank you, if you look at the election of Donald Trump, what's what happened to Bitcoin right after he was elected? <laughs> it went up, right? And did people believe that Trump was going to be stable for the markets or potentially a bit volatile? <laughs> so I think uh, Bitcoin is becoming a uh, a contrarian view of the nation state or the stability of the world. So when chaos and crisis emerge, we tend to see things like gold and Bitcoin go up. I, you know, I, I have anecdotal evidence, but actually I think Rob would be the only guy who could tell us about this. This, this is what he does. <laughs> sure. I, I mean, uh, I, I want to believe that Bitcoin's negatively correlated to these other things. The reality is, mathematically, they're the zero correlation. But that's also a beautiful thing for a portfolio, right? You, you want zero correlating assets. So we haven't seen Bitcoin largely adopted yet during a major financial crisis. But one thing that I can say is a lot of other financial assets... They're very like opaque, interconnected webs of levered instruments that no one really knows who the other counterparties are. We don't exactly have that. Bitcoin is largely an equity-based type of asset. So I, I don't imagine it had those kinds of cascading runs. Yeah, I'll just add, I don't think we've seen it as much in this country yet, mostly because even despite 2008 and the financial crisis, the dollar has still remained relatively stable compared to most world currencies. But if you look at some other countries, such as places like Venezuela, where they have runaway inflation, um, they have naturally started to move to other stores of value like Bitcoin um, because they know the government can't just take it from them or hyperinflate it on them. And I think any country that's dealt with those kind of economic problems, they understand the possibilities and the opportunity of Bitcoin and crypto much quicker than we do here in this country. Mm -hmm. uh, question, uh, yes. Do you ever see any price stability coming in Bitcoin? Do you think it always is going to be on this uh, constant uptrend? And well, I don't know if that's a hard question to answer, but you know, when you sit back and you say it's going to go to 500,000. Has gold ever stabilized? <laughs> not constant supply, uh, non-constant demand. Uh, yeah, I, I, my feeling is that 
as you get into the higher prices, the, uh, the, 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 the absolute nominal dollar changes on a percentage basis diminish. So with Bitcoin at 100,000 of Bitcoin, the you know, five, uh, 1%, 2% move might look great, but it's uh, on a percent basis a lot less. So it's only because it's on these lower prices that you see these gap moves. You have seen, I've seen, I think, four or maybe five crashes of 60, 70, 80% already, but they're getting less. <laughs> So uh, this is this recent move uh, from 5,000 to, to 3,000. It looks scary, but on, on the history of Bitcoin, this is ain't nothing. This ain't nothing. I want to say we got some death threats on like uh, back in 2011. I bought, I put all my savings into Bitcoin and now it's $7. I bought at 14. How dare you t talk about it? And it's like, uh, <laughs> so it's all, you know, it is a very volatile uh, currency, um, as it, but I, I assume it will get less and less so as it's wider and wider adoption. And you know, back in those days, people were a little bit less sure about what the heck this actually was, and there were more thefts, by the way, of Bitcoin. I, I think it's getting a little bit safer and more secure a lot of the sites, but back then everything got hacked. Like, I, I, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I think you probably had a billion dollars worth eventually stolen. But it's just like, um, I think it's getting more secure, right? Mm -hmm. Hopefully. Yeah, we hope. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, the, act the actual protocol of Bitcoin has not ever really been insecure and has never been hacked or anything like that. What you've always had is the centralized entities. And obviously, over time, as the industry grows, those entities get better at protecting their assets or, you know, things like hardware wallets start to proliferate or other ways to have cold storage. So there, there is absolutely safe ways to keep this and that will just keep getting better. And on the volatility subject, I think much like Max said, I think the reason it seems so volatile is just because the market cap is so small. I mean, we look at crypto right now and we see, you know, 130, 150 billion dollar market cap. And we're like, wow, that's so much larger than it used to be. But um, anyone who pays attention to, you know, the world's financial picture knows that's still a tiny, tiny little drop in the bucket. Um, there's, there's much larger um, asset classes out there that dwarf this industry. And as it continues to grow, it will inevitably stabilize. You won't, you won't see the same percentage swings that you see now when you have a much larger market cap. Yeah, just to put it into context, I believe Apple has $250 billion in cash on their balance sheet just sitting mm -hmm. there. So uh, they exactly. could buy up all, every single crypto out there and all yeah. the tokens. Yes, exactly. Although if they tried to, of course, the price would run away to the moon. <laughs> Any more questions? This guy, Mike Parson. If I can make one comment about the Bitcoin price and its future value. Uh, if you consider how many millionaires are there in the world, are there more than 21 million? There are, definitely. How many Bitcoins will there be eventually? Probably less than 21 million, or 21 maximum. So if each millionaire wants to buy one Bitcoin, one Bitcoin per millionaire, what would the price be? Madison County and the other institutions and all the other retail investors. So that's my view of the price of Bitcoin. Has anybody ever done a study of actually how many Bitcoin are lost forever? The private key gone? I think it's somewhere around 5%. 5%? 5%. 5%. 5%. 5%. 5%. 5%. 5%. 5%. 5%. 5%. 5%. 5%. 5%. 5%. 5%. 5%. 5%. 5%. 5%. 5%. 5%. 5%. 5%
you know, uh, appeal to the to the press and get and just uh, stomp around like a, a two year old, because he doesn't have those tools to to deal with. And that that shows you that we don't have them. Now, would it I, I it would give some depth to the market, but it also it's a double edged sword in my view. It gives uh, the it opens up room for abuse from the same people that abuse the market today. But it's a, it's kind of a race to see whether adoption and the Bitcoin ethos can replace the fiat currency and the fiat ethos. Because in America, we've grown up, we now believe that in America, fraud is an acceptable business model, thanks to Wall Street. So, I mean, crypto hopefully will re-educate and bring in something new, I think, hopefully. Yeah. The guy in red? So how, how good of a job did they do shutting down file sharing? Mm -hmm. And what, what country is IP theft legal? <laughs> it's not. Uh, if they try to shut it down, the technology just gets better, and we get better and better at avoiding them. And so currencies will get more anonymous. It'll become harder to know who owns what where. Decentralized exchanges will get significantly more advanced. The other thing in, is that governments won't coordinate in this uh, respect. Mm -hmm. so is there a universal tax code throughout the whole world, mm -hmm. or are there tax havens? You know, so there's always going to be governments like Switzerland and others who are going to be very pro-crypto in certain respect. And so if some government shuts it down, there's a mass exodus of people to another jurisdiction. Going to China, for example, the very first thing people started asking about when the China ban came down is how do we move money to Hong Kong or to Singapore or to similar jurisdictions? So I just don't think the event's going to occur. And if it does occur in a, a limited capacity, we'll just see a massive investment into decentralization. So I'll pass to you. Yeah, the, I, I would argue that it's, it's basically already too late for that to happen. Um, if governments had, you know, started to put this kind of action, you know, four or five years ago, they might have been able to have more of an effect. But it's just grown too fast. And it's pretty much exactly what Charles just said. You can't get the governments of the world to agree on anything. Um, you're absolutely not going to get them to all agree to ban crypto at the same time. And for every one, every jurisdiction that takes draconian measures, there'll be another jurisdiction that sees opportunity and invites uh, the businesses and the opportunity to come there. In fact, we even see this just within the United States itself. You know, the United States is kind of this laboratory of democracy, at least it likes to claim it is. And you do see this, that the states have different approaches. So, you know, you get New York with the bit license who tries to clamp things down and put onerous regulations. And then you have Delaware, you know, not in more than a month or two later say, hey, you all can come here. We're not going to put these regulations on you. Start your companies here. And you'll see this on a global scale more and more. Every country that knocks it down, another one will see it as an opportunity. Yeah, I just want to quickly add... We that said, I completely agree with you guys, but we shouldn't discount the harm that they can actually do to real people. So that, that's the dark side of it, right? They can't kill the industry, but they could hurt a lot of people, which, you know, in some selective cases, they already have. Um, yes, sir. So do you think Jamie Dimon did what he did to get a better entry point into Bitcoin? <laughs> <laughs> They're is already in, man. Is it a bullish signal? Is the question. I do know for a fact that his London traders, remember he said in his statement that he would fire anybody who trades Bitcoin in his desk. I do know for a fact that somebody developed an app for JP Morgan traders specifically back in 2013 to trade Bitcoin. And I guess that uh, some of these engineers and code writers over here would understand this better, but I believe he, they made it in XLS or something like that because Th their their actual browser was being monitored by their bosses. So they were tra trading Bitcoin. And there was a special exception for Max Kaiser because their algorithm was trading off Bitcoin mentions on Twitter. And at that time in 2013, it wasn't a big story. Nobody really big in no media was covering it. And anytime Max would tweet about Bitcoin, the price would go berserk and they would have to leave their trading desk at JP Morgan and go over and like shut down the, um, their app that had been developed. So I know they had a sophisticated app developed that couldn't deal with Max Kaiser. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yes, yes, sir. So with Bitcoin, when we get closer to the 21 million, dollar, uh, 21 million Bitcoin supply, and there's, you know, the incentive starts to diminish you know, for miners, right? If the little eventually goes away, how do you see the network being 
Well, that's uh, we have more than a hundred years until that takes place, so that's a problem. I think we can wait a couple of decades before we start worrying about. The general thought at the moment is that network fees will pick up the slack there, but again, that's about 120 years from now, so tons of time to worry about that later. What will Bitcoin prices be by then? 21 million. If we're still alive. <laughs> uh, right there, gentlemen, go. Um, purely on an investment side, that, as the industry grows, what type of sort of self-policing do you see as there seems to be a smaller amount of people who are making decisions in the crypto world, and there's about six or seven people who are very influential in the recommendations, but they also run companies, they also own a lot of cryptos. And where does that become a, a rather dangerous line as, as it becomes more and more knowledge comes into it? Uh, well, and so which, this is a topic of governance, right? And um, so I, I, I think uh, I can speak a little bit about Dash. <laughs> uh, you know, Dash has an interesting model where you've got the master nodes who are weighing in on decisions uh, about the protocol and they have a vested interest in how it runs and so they've, they've come up with a a, a governance solution uh, in that, that that ecosystem that addresses these problems and i think these different coins are approaching these issues according in similar ways by variations on the basic bitcoin theme so then it comes back to competition. So if it's a perception is that one group is becoming overly concentrated and making decisions that are not in the best interest of the network or the community, the, the dynamism of the, of the economy is such that people can quickly move into other areas. Um, you know, the problem with authoritarian regimes in the physical space is that people are trapped. You know, they can't leave countries. You know, they, they movement, freedom of movement is curtailed. But here, in this frictionless environment, you can move. And as the interoperability of all these chains become more of a reality, then you're gonna see a lot of, not, not necessarily price movement um, fluctuations, but uh, mi migration of, of capital. Not necessarily moving the price around, but, but moving the influence of different schemes around, if you will. So it, 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 that's yet to come. You know, you look in the sky and you see birds flying in those beautiful patterns, depending on what's <coughs> happening. This could happen in the, okay, I'm rambling now. <laughs> Anyone else want to? Uh, Ask a, who has more power, miners or the developers? This is an issue that's often raised, like the developers will complain that the miners have too much power and the miners complain that the developers have too much power. Well, it's, it's pretty darn clear that all the developers are not of one singular mindset and all of the miners are not of one singular mindset. and. Uh, I guess that's one of Bitcoin and cryptocurrency's biggest strengths and also one of its weaknesses because there is no person you can go to and say, hey, make a decision. And even if, you know, Vitalik with the Ethereum, if he made some decision and the rest of the people didn't like it, it wouldn't happen. So uh, we're going to kind of find out. There's a thousand and one different cryptocurrencies out there and a lot of them have different governance structures. It's a big giant uh, evolution of governance as well. So we'll find out. I think Mike, I was also OTC markets all the time and it's against the law and you know, I, I you're likely that. to get I mean, in there's trouble. There's a lot of things that have mimicked the equity world that have happened yeah. here. The internet, as you because, because humans make up the equity world. Humans make up this world. So you're saying you didn't buy the Floyd Mayweather ICO after he recommended it to you? Is that what you're telling me? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's, it's like all things in life, just buyer beware. And if Floyd Mayweather tells you to buy his ICO, probably don't. <laughs> yeah, I mean... I, But I, I think the point is that a lot of us in the industry think that the consumers should be making those decisions for themselves in the first place and not a regulatory agency or a government saying, here are the rules and you don't have enough money, you're not an accredited investor, you're not allowed to make these decisions because we don't trust you enough. Um, we think consumers should do their own research and they should make their own decisions. And if you see someone that's pumping something and you think that it's there's some nefarious activity out there, you might be right. Don't like... Be suspicious, be skeptical.
question, 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 question. Yes, sir. Um, so as I understand, it's segwit 2 x discussion going on, which would further fracture the Bitcoin network, yet you're all using the term Bitcoin as if it were one thing. What do you think would happen in November, apparently? And what would that do to the name of the Bitcoin? Well, Rock has already said publicly that it's going to fork. Charles, do you have anything to add about the Bitcoin fork in well, What again? should we name it, like Bitcoin Classic? <laughs> <laughs> There's so many to argue over the naming. <laughs> <laughs> Can we sell the naming rights? Can we have an ICO for that? <laughs> uh, people need to start pulling their heads out of their asses and agreeing. Uh, you know, it's not productive for the ecosystem to have these types of conversations. Uh, and I think that we need to learn that compromise is necessary. But I don't think it's going to happen. And I think we'll see more fracturing. And that's okay. And that's why there's a thousand altcoins. That's why there's tons of different standards. Uh, and we'll eventually figure it out over the long run. Um, actually, I have a question about Ethereum. So when Ethereum first came out, there was this notion that uh, there was going to be so much built on this blockchain. Yeah, we broke that on your I know you. They broke it on Kaiser Report. Um, I didn't get any ether, so I didn't. Know. <laughs> 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 yeah, exactly. So uh, let me see. So ether. Uh, the the notion was that there were going to be all these sort of things that were could be put on the blockchain, mm -hmm. all sorts of applications, and it seems to be just these ICOs at the moment. I, is there any work going on? Like, no, I don't see that. Okay. Okay, so far be it for me to, to justify Joe and Vitalik and all the things they've promoted, but uh, we have seen uh, a lot of good innovation and progress on the platform. You know, For example, MakerDAO is trying to create uh, or had tried to create a, a value stable token. We saw things like Gollum, which is computation as a service to try to create like an Uber for computation. So a decentralized marketplace for that. Uh, the whole notion of can you build good oracles in your system, this is being tackled by Augur and Gnosis, and it's pivotally necessary for, uh, for a decentralized application ecosystem. Decentralized exchange is a, is a very important topic because it immunizes us from the evils of the government, and Ethereum is a really good platform to experiment with these types of ideas. The problem is that Ethereum's capabilities aren't such that it can act as a drop-in replacement for Amazon or for Axbase. It's just not capable enough as a platform from both the developer experience as well from the infrastructure experience, as well as a cost experience. So it, it's perfectly legitimate to view Ethereum as a uh, early stage project, and it requires another five or 10 years before we see the really, really good stuff evolving. But we're seeing it you know, slowly percolate, and most of these things will fail, but the ones that succeed will change the world. And um, so, I forget who we had on a as a guest, but they said that you know their notion was that Ethereum, the way it's built and all these things being put on top of it and ICOs, is actually there's a more incentive for the price to be lower. So the fact that the price is so high, I mean, is this does it have the same sort of built-in store of value? Should or should it as like Bitcoin has? Bitcoin, you can see, is a deflationary currency is going to go rise in value. But is there is the incentive for Ethereum actually to have a lower price so more stuff could happen? Right. So that's a really good question as well. So the, the first question is, uh, what are the economics of Ethereum with respect to, uh, to infrastructure on top? So we always took the position that Ethereum is like oil. You know, uh, gold, uh, Bitcoin's kind of like gold and Ether is the spiritual oil. So the, uh, underneath the hood, Ethereum's like a giant computational engine. It's not a very efficient one and it takes a lot of gas to run. Uh, but as you deploy more and more stuff, you increase the consumption of that gas. So uh, arguably, the, the price of, if the, you know, the supply is stable, the price ought to go up. As for ICOs causing problems, they cause problems in price in a very, uh, not such a, such a good way. So let's say you're FooCoin and you go and raise $100 million on Ether. Okay, great. You have now all this Ether. Now, most of the people don't sell it instantly. They don't hedge. They just hold on to it. And sometimes the price goes up. But when the price starts falling rather dramatically, as we've seen a lot of volatility in the cryptocurrency space as veterans, uh, what do you do? You panic because you have a fiduciary obligation to deliver the project, and now half your project capital has gone away. So you sell. Well, what did you, you know, what, 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 uh, you selling $50 million worth of the asset, what does that do to the price? It pushes it down. So then there's another ICO that raised at a, at a lower level, and they start selling. And then the next one, they start selling, and you have this kind of cascading failure in the price. And that can cause certainly a lot of problems. And because it's a mined currency, the miners also have the reserves, and they have a, 
profit window as well. So when the price starts collapsing, they have to sell the reserves. So we haven't seen quite yet that cascading failure could happen, but that is one counter argument to uh, saying ICOs are good for the price. The other thing is liquidity of value. So most people put money in these ICOs. A lot of them are early Ether investors. What does that mean? It means that that value is illiquid. It wasn't in the marketplace. It wasn't being traded. It was kind of locked up and they got it at a very low price point. It's not new money entering Ether to pump up the price. So what you're doing is taking illiquid assets and now you're making them liquid, which again would probably depress the price of Ether as well. So I think it's a fair assessment to say that, uh, that you know, ICOs can cause price depression. Mm -hmm. okay. Any more questions? I think Rob and I disagree on that assessment. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. Rob. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if, if you guys want to. Yeah. Well, you can start, Roger. <laughs> So what, what, how do you, why do you say that, Roger? <laughs> <laughs> like anything, if you have more people using it, uh, the price is going to be higher. So all the people, maybe they buy Ethereum to participate in an ICO. Right. They put in $100 million to buy all those Ether, and then maybe later on they sell it, but all that money came in first, so you can't sell more money. Yeah, how do we know that it actually brought new people in? It's not just a uh, shell game. We're removing S a liquid assets to a liquid. A, a portion of it would have been new people coming in, and if mm -hmm. even a portion of it was, then the overall price for the ecosystem will be higher than it would have been before. Mm -hmm. So, But it definitely can cause lots of gyrations in the price. We right. completely mm -hmm. agree on that part. So this is actually really interesting. Like w w one of my earlier comments, I mentioned this whole cascading effect, and we, we probably don't see that you know as much in our space. But I do agree, Charles, that this is potentially a cascading risk that we haven't witnessed yet, um, but we might. So in the short term, sure, um, more demand for ICOs, more demand for ether. You're going to see you know upward pressure on price, but we could have this longer term effect of you know in in a declining market, we could start seeing. You know, particularly for you know these startups or these other companies that have raised capital, and they're seeing their capital that they have pegged to this other asset's price has nothing to do with their project. They have a fiduciary responsibility to their their investors. They're going to be forced to sell, right? So we could see cascades in the future. It's certainly a risk. One small comment, but as the industry and p companies get more and more practice, standards will be set, right? There are going to be best practices that come out. If you do an, a crowd sale and you raise a lot in Ether, these are the best practices so you don't cause havoc to the community. Um, and so we'll see more and more of that. And if you are a company that wants to be more responsible than that, you know, you'll go out into the community and ask for, like, what did you learn in your experience? What, what worked, what didn't work, and take from those and improve upon it, right? So in, with this Ether uh, question, though, if you, you, you are calling it uh, the analog of oil, right? So oil industry tells us something. It's, it has to be high enough to, uh, to, to spur uh, exploration, but not too high to uh, dampen demand from consumers. So in that way, there's a sweet spot. Uh, unlike, let's say, Bitcoin, w which is would be more like gold, or the, where, where a higher price is pretty much always welcome, right? So the ecosystem of Ether, would, there's a sweet spot, not too high, not too low. Yeah, it, it, That's different than cr Bitcoin, where people have a bias toward a higher price, and they would support that bias. Right, and there's a collection of computations that are affordable to run for any price window. So right now, there's only a, a set of things that Ether we can afford to run, and the vast majority of things we can't. So as the engine gets more efficient, or we invent a whole bunch of new technology in the Ethereum ecosystem to allow us to shard or scale, then we can actually start walking into the conventional server space and so forth. But at the end of the day, you're absolutely right. There is an equilibrium point for, for any amount of demand and for any amount of infrastructure that's deployed. But on. it wasn't sold as a store of value. No, it never was. Right. In fact, we had persistent linear inflation when we, uh, when right. we released it. But, you know, oil is still pretty valuable. Yeah, no, but, but, yeah, but, I, but I'm saying that people's expectation about Ether who are buying it, like, I'm going to buy crypto, I'm going to buy Ether, I'm going to buy Bitcoin, they, they, they're, they're not really similar in terms of what you might expect as a bang for the buck. Because right. Because Ether, there is, as you've described it, more of a sweet spot that's not too high. Right. Right? So yeah. And, it, you know, it's also interesting to point out in the uh, Dow ruling that the SEC had, they actually called Ether a currency in the ruling, if you read it really, really carefully. Okay, I think we have time for maybe one more question and then we gotta wrap it up. Crypto show in the back.
or until I missed the, the back half of the question. <laughs> is uh, Ethereum switching to proof of stake? Yes. Proof of well, Ethereum is, yes. Yeah, they're, they're moving to Casper, uh, and they've been on that roadmap for now over a year and a half, I believe, or two years. Uh, they'll they'll go wherever it's most profitable to mine. If it's GPU centric, maybe they'll go to Zcash. Maybe they go to ETC. You know, they, they'll make that decision on a, a facts and circumstance basis and a market dynamics basis. But I think Ethereum Classic will be pretty competitive for them to go to. Okay, that's, that's it. it. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.